All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Whatever time of day this is for you. I know we have some registrants from around the globe, as well as here in the U.S. We are really glad that you are joining us. My name is Katie Stearns. I am the Chief Global Corporate Solutions Officer at Points of Light. And that means I have the opportunity on a daily basis to work with companies around the world as they think about how they can create meaningful social impact, how they can engage their employees in volunteering and other types of civic engagement. And that's what we are here to talk about today. So thank you for joining us. As you know, we are talking about why we need more than volunteering. And we have intentionally positioned this as a session for those of you who sit within a business, sit within a company, maybe you have CSR or employee volunteer program responsibilities, maybe you lead HR or DEI. But what we want to be able to do today is introduce you to the Points of Light Civic Circle, and in particular, our Civic Circle Learning Session, which is a great resource, a great opportunity for you to introduce your employees and your colleagues to why we need more than volunteering and why civic engagement is so important for creating the kind of change that we all wanna see in the world. So what we're gonna to do today is gonna to be maybe a little meta for a webinar. We're actually just going to invite you to be our audience in the Civic Circle Learning Session. You will get to experience it as your employees would. We're highly interactive over here at Points of Light, so I hope you're ready for that, have had your caffeine. Um, but we're gonna dig right in and show you what this Civic Circle Learning Session looks like. And then at the end, we'll talk briefly about how you might be able to bring this to your colleagues and to your employees. So with that, if you were to work with Points of Light for the Civic Circle Learning Session, this is what you would experience. So again, hello, my name is Katie Stearns. I'm joined today by my colleague, Olivia Diener, and we are really excited to have you all with us for why we need more than volunteering and talk about your role in creating meaningful community change. So we're gonna explore what it means to be civically engaged and how these actions can make an impact on the issues and the causes that you care about in your own community. This will not be a one-sided conversation because we know that the change that we wanna see in our communities and in our world begins with each of us. So this learning session is very interactive. There will be moments for reflection along the way and your participation is gonna be really integral to the experience. We're gonna introduce you to the civic circle and then we'll talk briefly about how you can apply it to causes that you care about, about how privileges and barriers factor in, and then the next steps that you can take. So on the interactive note, please take a moment and go to menti.com using the code on the screen. You can scan that QR code, whatever is easiest. I recommend doing this from your phone if you can, so you don't have to toggle back and forth between browser windows, but um, if you don't have your phone handy and you want to do it in your browser, that will work too, feel free. Once you are logged into Menti, you will be connected to the questions and to the polls that are within the presentation. I'll tell you two things. First, there are no wrong answers. So we encourage you to just participate and share your candid thoughts. And second, all of the responses are anonymous. So please be open, feel free to be honest in the questions that we're gonna be asking you. We'll give folks just a few seconds to get logged into Menti. And when you do, you should see the presentation sync with your phone or with your browser. So let's just give this a try. Make sure that everybody had a chance to get logged in here. So a quick test to get you familiar with using Menti. Please share a place in the world that you are most interested in visiting. It could be a country, a city, a specific location or landmark. Would love to hear about your travel aspirations. Oh, yes, Fiji, Thailand. I wanna go traveling with some of you. We love this. This is a great list, terrific. I am personally a, uh, a lifelong fan of Scotland, but I love the variety of places that we have up here on the screen. Great. 
So it looks like most of you have had a chance to log into Menti. That's terrific. You can see how easy it is to use. So keep that phone, keep that browser handy. We'll be asking you to share your input and your reflections throughout the presentation today. All right, we're ready to go. So let's get started. Points of Light is a nonpartisan global nonprofit organization that inspires, equips, and mobilizes people to take action that changes the world. Notice that we do not say to volunteer to change the world. We say to take action that changes the world. We envision a world where every individual can discover their power to make a difference and create healthy communities in vibrant, participatory societies. We do this in partnership with 145 affiliates in 39 different countries and with thousands of other nonprofit organizations and companies, including many of you on the line. And that has enabled us to engage 3.7 million volunteers in 16.7 million hours of service each year. So we really focus on bringing the power of people to where it is needed most. Uh, so what does that mean? Why should you care? Well, over the last 30 years, Points of Light has really built programs and partnerships to help fulfill that mission. But in the last three or four years, we've also dedicated ourselves to studying what it means to bring that mission to life. In other words, how are people making a difference? Why are they choosing to do so? What challenges are they facing? When we did some research back in 2020, we found that three in 10 adults were interested in volunteering, but they had not done so in the past year. And when we questioned them further, a whopping 66% of them said they didn't believe that they could make an impact in their community. 40% didn't know what they could do that would be helpful. And 44% weren't sure how they could get involved. <laughs> if any of that resonates with you and your experience or resonates perhaps with the experience that your colleagues and employees have, when you think about what it means to do good, our hope is that today's conversation will really help guide you towards some actionable steps that you can take. So as we dive in, we wanna first begin by taking a moment to think about an issue or a cause that you are passionate about. Maybe it's something that you have long been a supporter of, maybe there's an issue or a cause with which you have a lived experience or someone that you know does, something broader that's happening in your community. So would love for you all to plug your answers into Menti. What issue or cause are you most passionate about? I have a feeling that on this line, of lots of people who care about social impact and community change. We have passions for lots of different issue areas. Education, wonderful social justice, food insecurity, absolutely. See some connected issues, workforce development, underemployment. Great. Yes, terrific. I knew we had come to a group with our people, people who care about what's happening in their communities. So this is terrific, a great list, certainly. So many good causes, meaningful causes for us all to be passionate about. Wonderful. Okay, so thinking about that cause, have you taken some form of action in support of that issue or cause in the last six months? Something large, something small, but have you had a chance to actually take an action? that helps to support that cause that you named? Okay, great, let us know here. Just choose yes or no on your screen. Terrific. Got a couple of folks answering no, but a good group of folks who are also saying yes, they've been able to take action. Great, certainly okay if the answer is no. We understand what that looks like and there can be lots of reasons why that is the case. So I'm curious, for those of you that said you haven't taken some form of action, please share why. And even if you did take action, I'm curious, why might someone answer no, even if it's an issue that they care about? What might be some of the reasons why someone would answer that question no, they hadn't been able to take any action? 
Yes, for sure. This resonates so much with the research that I was just sharing with all of you. There are people who don't know where to start. <laughs> They're not sure if they would be able to make a difference. Time is a premium. Absolutely. Our schedules and our calendars can make it hard. And it can be really difficult to figure out what you can do that would be meaningful and to easily access what that opportunity is. That's great. Everybody, thank you so much. I think those are honest and real reasons why people might not be able to take action on causes that they cared about. What about on the flip side? If you were one of our yes answers, what inspired you to take that action around the cause that you cared about? Maybe you saw something in the news and you wanted to respond to it. Maybe you were asked by a friend or a colleague, would love to see what was your inspiration or motivation to take action if you were one of our yes answers? We'll get those popped up here just momentarily. I'm very curious to see what folks thought. Great, simple. Oh, we love it. The young folks inspiring us, your child. Yes, companies that make an easy way involved, jobs that give you time off for that. Absolutely. Someone said, asked by a friend. I have to tell you, for years, the research has shown that being invited, being asked, is one of the number one reasons people will take action or volunteer. Yep. And finding nonprofits and opportunities in your community that are easy to jump into. That's terrific. Great. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Now that we've got a little bit of an understanding around your perspectives and, and your background on taking action, we want to share a little bit about the points of light framework for taking action. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Olivia. Thank you so much, Katie, for kicking us off. And yeah, I'm excited to dive in. You know, the word gets civic used a lot in this space, um, but by civic, we're referring to the duties or activities of people in relation to their town, city, local area, or a larger community that may not be location based. When we take action around the issues and causes we care about, we are taking civic action. And while civic engagement can be defined in a number of ways, it can broadly be defined as participation in activities or civic actions that improve a community or address a wider social issue. And so as we think about the types of actions that drive civic engagement, um, Katie and I are really interested. What comes to mind for you? Like what forms do these actions take? I'd love if we could uh, take a minute and you can share your ideas on Menti. We got some answers here. Let's see if we can show them. Looks like you might have to do the magic of showing those. You are right. Technology, we we try to get the best of it. Oh, here, I love this. Voting, lots of voting, participating in a march, board service, like a more formal, volunteering and voting. This is awesome. I'm loving the the through lines and also the different ways people people kind of approach this. So we want to spend some time talking about civic action and the ways in which people support the issues and causes they care about. Points of Light defines civic engagement through a framework we're calling the civic circle. The civic circle represents a person's power to lead, lend support, and take action for causes they care about and to live a civic life. It helps individuals connect to opportunities and understand that doing good, as we all know, comes in many different forms. And the great news is, no matter your age, people can take action through one or several elements of the civic circle. Now, we mentioned a few minutes ago that our recent research revealed that many people don't know how to get started when it comes to taking civic action and aren't sure they can make a difference. I think this even came up amongst this group here. So it's through the civic circle that we believe people can find a stepping stone to taking action. 
We want to take a few minutes for a brief walk around the civic circle. What does each circle represent? We're going to begin with listening and learning because this is the foundation for any civic action you take. The more informed you are, the better decisions you can make about how to best support your community and the issues and causes you care about. When we act without listening and learning, we can unintentionally cause harm. So it's really important to listen to the experts and those with lived experiences, research a topic, and so much more. So let's get started. We'll start with volunteer. This is defined as sharing your time and talent to advance a cause or support resolution for a societal issue without personal gain. From a one-time activity to pro bono service, volunteerism takes many shapes and forms. This can include mowing the lawn of an elderly neighbor or sitting on the board of a nonprofit. Moving right along to service, we often think of service as being synonymous with volunteerism. But Points of Light defines service as committing time, energy, and talent in support of the greater public good. Now, this can include stuff like national service, including AmeriCorps military service, local fire, fire and law enforcement, and those in public office. Next up is donate, broadly defined as sharing personal resources to advance a cause. I think we're all fairly familiar with this one. It can be financial through the donation of goods and services, mutual and aid, and even medical donations like blood. Fourth is purchase power. Purchase power is when you make spending decisions that reflect your values or advance a cause you care about. We see this when we shop small or when we support BIPOC-owned businesses. Continuing right along to work, which I know you all will appreciate, the work bubble represents making choices about employment based on the values and purpose of the place you work or how you can leverage workplace giving programs to support a cause. And while some may go into a specific field like becoming a teacher because they're really passionate about education, others may value working for an employer that provides opportunities to meaningfully support their communities. So this is where the work you all do becomes especially topical and important. The next bubble is social entrepreneur. This is identifying a need that has not been met by traditional institutions, structures, and systems, and using an entrepreneurial spirit to drive change. Social entrepreneurs bring innovative solutions to tackle problems. Moving along to voice, defined as influencing your network to raise awareness, promote, protest, advocate, or advance a social cause or issue. We see the use of voice and art, music on social media, and even around the dinner table with friends and family. Finally, let's talk about the vote circle. This refers to engaging in the political process from participation in elections to supporting efforts that increase election engagement. It's more than the act of voting itself and can include becoming a poll worker or even just supporting a candidate. Within each circle, civic actions can be both or, sorry, civic actions can be formal or informal in nature. Formal actions are typically through existing structures and institutions. For example, volunteering for a day of service through a nonprofit organization, donating to a canned food drive at work, or voting at your designated polling place during an election. Informal actions tend to not be through traditional structures and can be more ad hoc or kind of grassroots, can include cooking meals for a sick neighbor, colleagues collecting clothes and household items for a coworker who lost their home to a fire, or having a conversation with friends about a cause you're actively supporting. Often, the informal actions are the ones we don't consider to be taking civic action but they can have the same level of significance as more formal actions. In fact, this past January, Points of Light conducted research in the US, the UK, India, and Brazil, and found that leading civic actions around the world were less typical forms of civic engagement, including listening and learning and using your voice. There is truly no one size fits all for civic engagement. 
So let's take a moment to reflect by visiting the question Katie posed earlier about the civic actions you've taken in the last six months. Keeping in mind what we've learned about the civic circle, what would your answer about taking act would your answer about taking action change at all? Have you done more than you realized and kind of in what ways? Oh, I love this. Yes, I definitely did. That's what we're hoping for. <laughs> I've helped neighbors and wasn't thinking of that as civic. I love that. Yeah, I think there's so many small sort of low barrier to entry things that we can do to engage. There are so many ways to be civic. Volunteer council leadership at work brought food to those who are sick. This is great. And I think really opens the door for how we think about things and what we can do to affect change. Conversation with friends about civic issues. Yeah, definitely using your voice. Micro funding request from a friend. Not only does this harken to what Katie was mentioning about friends asking friends to get involved, but also a micro fund, a really innovative solution. Watched a documentary. These are really great. And, and thanks for sharing your responses. Hopefully these different iterations of civic action inspire you on a personal level, but there may be some of you thinking, okay, so now I have a better idea of the things I can do to take action, but how does that lead to real and impactful change? Totally fair. I'd encourage you to think about when you've seen large scale change. Can you think of an example of when people power drove change? What comes to mind? This could be something that had a national or global impact, or even one that occurred in your own community. Oh, I love this. Advocacy, civil rights, yes. Protest changing policies. I think there's so many real world examples of that. GoFundMe's, yeah, this is, this is all really good. Marches, yeah, you look at like the civil rights movement, suffragist movement, no Mome to help pollinators, big fan of pollinators myself, so appreciate that shout out. Awesome, George Floyd protests, yeah, a, a more recent example, speaking at a school council meeting, these are really wonderful, thank you. And I think what's great is that the civic circle, and I think this has come up in our in our answers, is interconnected. Each circle can work together to accelerate change for the issues and causes you care about. Points of Light believes that civic action is more effective and impactful when multiple actions are taken in combination with one another. Going back to our question about people-powered change, we haven't seen an instance where we could simply volunteer or donate our way out of a challenge. Wouldn't that be nice? Marriage equality came from people using their voices at protests, voting for leaders who would push for certain legislation, donating to organizations that work on behalf of the LGBTQIA plus community, and many more actions over a number of years. Sustained change requires a combination of actions. And hear me when I say, change is not about you as an individual doing everything. It's about the collective power of your action combined with your neighbor's action, combined with your co-workers' action, and so on. Ultimately, this can lead to meaningful systems change. Bringing it all together, why should you care? You might be thinking that these aren't new concepts. Points of Light didn't invent donating or voting. Totally true. <laughs> We didn't. But when we think about the challenges in the world today, challenges that have largely existed for long periods of time and frankly seem to be getting worse, we need to reconsider how we tackle these challenges. For most of our challenges, if our governments, nonprofits, or companies act alone, we don't see sustained change. But when these entities across sectors work together, we start to see change happen. The same is true when it comes to individual civic action. We need the power of the individual people to affect change, but that power can't be one dimensional. And so by utilizing a combination of civic actions, change becomes more impactful and happens more quickly. So 
While the world does not need us to create new forms of engagement, people do need a more expansive understanding of what they, the individual, can do to accelerate change. I'm going to turn it back over to Katie to bring life to what it means to apply the civic circle to a specific issue. Thanks, Olivia. I always think it's really powerful and important to remember that last point that you made, that it's not about what each of us can do as individuals. So I know that we just covered a lot. We just uh, zoomed around that circle there pretty quickly, but we want to take a few minutes to talk about how you can put the civic circle to work in your personal life, in your professional life. So we're going to explore an issue that we know affects many communities around the world, and, and it even came up earlier when we asked what causes you are passionate about, and that is food insecurity. So before we jump into the activity, let's take a moment to talk about food insecurity. You can consider this your first application of the listening and learning action. Feeding America defines food insecurity as a lack of consistent access to enough food for every person in a household to live an active, healthy life. And it's important to remember that it's about more than just having sufficient access to any food. It's really about having access to quality, nutritious food. So for example, a family might rely on fast food or processed foods because they can't afford to buy fresh produce. The causes of food insecurity and hunger are certainly more than we have time to cover today. And really they're different based on where you sit in the country and where you sit in the world. But a few of them are included here on the screen. Poverty, underemployment, uh, a low income, a lack of access to affordable housing in your community, chronic health conditions, or a lack of access to health care can be big factors in food insecurity, as can environmental and climate factors like drought or supply chain issues. And then, of course, an underlying cause that we know impacts food insecurity is systemic racism and racial discrimination. And, and just to underscore the global scale of this issue, here are a few statistics from the World Food Program. They say that up to 811 million people around the world go to bed hungry every night, and that 44 million people are on the edge of famine. So clearly an issue that faces most communities, most countries, something that can seem big and overwhelming and challenging. So I want you to think back to the civic circle and, and start to brainstorm. Remember the actions that we talked about, the nine actions. What actions can be taken in support of food insecurity? What actions can be taken to address it? You can certainly select a few circles, share several ideas with us. And we would love your creative thoughts, maybe focus on solutions that tackle this issue from a local, national, global perspective. Maybe think about one of the circles that you're less familiar with, right? So we know that you can volunteer, you can vote, you can use your voice, you can listen and learn, you can donate. We've got work, social entrepreneurship, purchase power and service when we think about the full circle. So which of those actions can be activated to address food insecurity? Absolutely. Donating food, that's a really clear, obvious one. And that can be to organizations or even giving food directly to individuals. Yep, listening and learning about the issues. And I see a couple of ways up here that you can do that. Watching a documentary, even reading statistics on the World Food Program page can be a helpful way to listen and learn. Yes, I see purchase power on here. Shopping from organizations that support food security. I think that's right. I see some examples of how you could use your voice. You can advocate. You can vote for legislation that will help address food security on a more sustainable basis. Talk to your friends and family. Absolutely. Love it. Great. This is a great list of ways that we can take action for food insecurity. We had a couple of ideas as well, and I think these are actions that you could take either on your own 
with your family. Olivia mentioned the civic circle is very family friendly. There are also actions that you could take in your workplace or with your colleagues, things like um, volunteering by supporting and um, sorting food donations at a food bank. You could at your workplace host a canned food drive. Everyone's seen those projects where people build arches and buildings out of the canned foods that have been collected. I saw a couple people mention the opportunities that they have to use their voice and take action on that circle, talking to friends and family, um, being an advocate in a more formal setting, certainly an option. There are opportunities to listen and learn everywhere, um, but also to think about how service can be incorporated, right? Serving on a school board that's working to expand their own programs in order to provide meals for students throughout the summer or who are on holiday break who might not have access to plenty of nutritious food at home. So what we hope this really gives you a sense of are all of the ways that we can take action on issues. And I think it's important to push ourselves past the maybe the easy ones, the ones that come to mind most immediately, like donating food or working at a food bank, because when we look at all of these actions separately, we know they can support the issue of food insecurity. But when we look at them collectively, when we think about the ideas that you all just shared on that last slide, if we're working together, your action combined with my action combined with Olivia's action, so much can be accomplished. And that's where we really start to see the possibility of systemic change. So if you imagine all of these civic actions working together in your local community, it's really possible for us to move the needle on food insecurity and for us to be able to accelerate change. It's those combined civic actions. They're gonna get that work done. So let's take a moment to reflect on the civic circle and this exercise in particular. I'm curious to know if anything surprised you. Is there anything that you didn't expect to see as part of civic action? Has learning about the civic circle changed your view on what civic engagement means? I'm curious to hear if there have been any surprises and, and why. And if your view hasn't changed, right? If there haven't been any surprises, Maybe this has just reinforced for you what civic engagement can mean. Yeah, I love this answer. More things are civic action than I thought. I feel very much the same way. Like Olivia said, you know, Points of Light did not create voting or volunteering or donating, but understanding all of those things as civic action, understanding that listening and learning about causes and taking the time to get to know a community is a civic action that we can take because it's the foundation that helps us be better volunteers, more informed donors, <laughs> more informed voters, right? That equips us to use our voices to talk about what's happening with the social issues in our community. This is great, thanks for sharing. Feel free to continue putting those answers in so we can see them. I do want to note too that I think some of the activities that we've talked about and that you all are sharing addressed the symptoms of an issue, right? For example, um, provide a meal to someone who is hungry. And some of the actions get more toward the root causes. Both are needed, right? We do need to address and solve for the symptoms at the same time as we are trying to solve for those root causes. And we really believe that the civic circle can help you and your company, your family, your community understand where your civic action and civic energy is going. And as we mentioned earlier, it's worth saying again, it's not about you or any one person doing everything. Being civically engaged doesn't require that you, you know, keep a checklist of the civic circle and you check off all nine things um, or that we all do the same of the nine things. What, it, what sparks my passion and my interest, what is meaningful to me is probably going to be different than what sparks your interest and passion and what you find to be meaningful. 
But if we're all taking actions around the civic circle and working together toward a common goal, meaningful change is really possible. So I wanna transition a little bit at this point and have a discussion about the privileges and the barriers that can be associated with civic engagement. And as we do so, we wanna start with a, a question as an introduction to this concept. So I'm gonna challenge you on this, uh, on this midday Tuesday. So forget about civic engagement for a moment, probably not what you expected me to say, and take a moment to think about something that you are good at doing, a hobby, a talent, a skill. It could be anything, something that you are good at doing. For me, for example, I really enjoy trying new recipes. <laughs> I enjoy cooking. I don't have a ton of time to do it, but when I do get that opportunity, I'm good at it. It gives me um, fulfillment. So hopefully you all have been able to come up with something that you enjoy doing, something that you are good at. So keeping that in mind, and I'm not gonna ask you to share, <laughs> think about what makes that something accessible for you? What makes it easy for you to do? It could be that you have the time to dedicate to that particular hobby. Maybe um, even that you have the financial resources to purchase whatever is required, the equipment, the supplies to participate in that hobby or that activity. Maybe it's that your partner or your family are supportive of you being involved in that activity or the hobby. So if we use my example, I think about trying new recipes and cooking, it's, it's accessible for me because I have the privilege of having home Wi-Fi and a computer so I can look up however many versions of a recipe for Parmesan Brussels sprouts that I want to, right? I can compare and contrast the 10 and figure out which one I wanna try. I also have access to transportation. So if I need to go to a few different stores to find the ingredients that I'm looking for, I have the ability to do that. And I also have the ability to be able to purchase ingredients that might be a little bit pricey or that um, I might wanna try for a new recipe, but I'm not sure I will ever use again. So those are some of the things that make it easy or accessible for me to pursue that that passion, that hobby. Hopefully you've come up with a few for yourself. So for whatever hobby, talent, or skill that you thought of, share with us, what makes that activity easy or accessible for you? Maybe the examples that I gave gave you some ideas, but what makes it possible for you to engage in that particular hobby? Oh, childcare. Yes, absolutely. We hear this one all the time, right? Someone else to, uh, to focus on the young ones so that you're able to pursue transportation, phone with data. I think we forget that one uh, all too often. The physical ability, absolutely. Having the time, the weekends off. Transportation can be a big one. Yes, absolutely. A genuine interest in other people, maybe a touch of extroversion. We love it. Oh, yes. Gardening. That's another great one, especially at this time of year. And yes, absolutely. Having a green space right outside your door that you can work in or spend time in, that helps to make it easier, accessible. Membership funds, internet connection, money. Absolutely. Safe public trails for whatever that outdoor activity is. These are great. Yeah. Thank you for being reflective, everybody. Absolutely. Having these kinds of um, opportunities <laughs> makes it easier for us to pursue those things that we're passionate about and that we're good at. So I'm curious, as you look at all of these things, would these responses be true for everyone? Do we all have the same access and means? Even looking at these answers, of course, you know, the answer is no. And it's actually that point that speaks to the privileges and the barriers that are associated with the things that we do, with the actions that we are able to take. And that is true even for activities around civic engagement. The word privilege can sometimes come with negative connotations. And I think it can also make us feel uncomfortable or uneasy, especially for those of us in a position of privilege. 
having privilege often means having a benefit that is out of your control or something that you didn't choose for yourself. And honestly, it can sometimes be easier to see the privileges that others have instead of those that we might have. But privileges or a lack thereof, they can exist because of one's race, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, ability, religion, wealth, the neighborhood or the country that you live in. The list really goes on and on. And when we talk about barriers in the context of civic engagement, we're referring to the obstacles that someone may experience in the absence of certain privileges. So not having some of those privileges can create barriers for engagement. Having privilege itself is not a bad thing. While it may not be easy, it's really important to acknowledge that the privileges that I have, that the privileges that you may have, you have because you can translate them into supporting others who may not have the same advantages. And you can actually be part of making systems more fair and more equitable for others. So as we think about civic engagement in particular and the opportunity that we have to take civic action, in what ways might it be harder for some people to participate? I'm curious to see what you all come up with here. Try to think about the civic circle as a whole. Where might there be challenges or barriers to participation? And feel free to pop in a couple of answers if they come to you. But what, what barriers might exist that would make it harder or difficult for someone to take civic action? Transportation, certainly, if they're needing to travel to a polling place or to a volunteer location, time, um, if they don't have the childcare, if they're not able to step away from work to participate in civic actions, access to information, language barriers certainly can be a factor. Finances can be a factor for some of those civic actions. Absolutely, there can be um, an absence of resources, um, and that can be material resources, physical resources, citizenship status can be a factor. There can be a variety, of, a variety of challenges or barriers that would get in the way of someone being able to take civic action. Thanks, everyone. Yes, these are great suggestions. I think they're right on. They're not fun to see, but an important reminder that those barriers really do exist. And as you can see, there are barriers all around the civic circle. We've noted some of them here. Many of them are ones that you all named, right? Things like transportation. Um, there can be a barrier of not having a seat at the table or not being able to engage in listening and learning when something is not your lived experience. There are certainly places in this world without free speech where using your voice can be dangerous. There can be different consequences for choosing to use your voice. Plenty of individuals are employed in a workplace where there's not an accepted value of speaking up, or perhaps their company doesn't support the causes or the issues that they care about. Purchase power can be tough if you don't have disposable income, or if maybe there are limited choices for where to shop in your community. So there certainly can be barriers all around the circle, but what I think is important to recognize is that barriers are not immovable. They can be overcome. And as we look at some of the barriers that you all thought of, some of the barriers that we've noted here on this slide, like having the legal right to vote or the risks of retaliation for using one's voice, I want you to think about how we can be a mechanism for change, how, how we can use our privilege. Each of us can play a role in making sure that all of the ways to engage, all of the ways to take civic action are accessible. So when you become aware of a barrier, especially one that exists for others and not for you, your choice about what to do with that awareness and that empathy is really important. For example, um, maybe as part of your local PTA, 
um, or school council or school board, you might observe that there are parents that don't have an opportunity to participate because they don't have the transportation or the time or the childcare to be there in person. So you might observe that barrier and then choose to advocate for meetings to be held virtually, even post pandemic, so that there's greater access for those individuals to be part of taking civic action and to be part of what's happening in your community. So how you choose to use that awareness and that empathy is really important. So let's take a quick moment to reflect on this because the privileges that we have can open doors and they can increase accessibility for others all around the civic circle. So a few minutes ago, we asked you to think about potential barriers within the civic circle. Can you think of a barrier that exists for others perhaps someone specific or just um, folks other than yourself, but that doesn't exist for you. So a barrier that exists for others, but doesn't exist for you. What role might you be able to play in reducing or eliminating that barrier? I'll give you a moment here to reflect and then share with us in Menti what barrier might exist for others that doesn't exist for you and what role can you play in helping to move that barrier to create some space for that person to be civically engaged? Yes, absolutely. If folks don't have the space, the legal right, the confidence to be able to speak up, you can help make sure that their input is heard. Certainly you can contribute to causes that will help remove those barriers. Transportation, great and so easy, right? If you're gonna be out and about anyway, bring someone else along to go to that polling place or to go participate in that civic action, for sure. Having the knowledge and the resources about the services that exist, how to access them, yes, helping to spread the word. I think of a local example here in my community, we recently installed a community fridge at the community center and I don't regularly go by that corner, so I don't see whether the shelves are full or the freezer is full, but we've got other neighbors that regularly post in the Facebook neighborhood group about what's in the freezer and what's in the pantry and what is needed. So they help eliminate that barrier of lack of knowledge, perhaps lack of transportation so that folks know what is available and then remove that so that people can contribute and bring over donations to add to that fridge, to add to the community pantry. So. When we become aware of the barriers and we can help remove them from others, um, it really helps to open the door. So I know this can be a difficult question to think about and a difficult question to answer, but hopefully you'll be able to continue reflecting on the barriers that might exist for those around you to be civically engaged. And I think it's really an important reminder that sometimes the best way that we can support the causes or the issues that we care about is to actually ensure that someone else has access and opportunity to participate, right? Doing that can be part of the solution, as much a part of the solution as taking civic actions. Thanks for sharing this. Appreciate it, y'all. I'm going to turn it back over to Olivia here. Thanks, Katie, and uh, thanks for walking us through that in a really, you know, accessible and still eye-opening way. I think using our privilege as an item for reflection and empowerment is, is a really wonderful concept. Um, so let's revisit the issue or cause that you identified at the beginning. And during our final time together, we want to explore where you go from here. So this next step will be different for everyone because like Katie mentioned and emphasized, and I can really resonate with myself, everyone's civic engagement journey is different. What actions are you most interested in exploring after this presentation? You know, this could be actions you want to take or areas you want to learn more about. Um, and, and what I love about this is you don't have to pick one, you know, I say, I think we can pick up to three here. Um, so we're really looking to see where, 
what, what resonated with you or kind of what overlap of, of civic engagement elements do you think would be really complementary to engaging in an issue area that you you care about? Listen and learn. I love that. As we mentioned, it's it's the first step before we get engaged with anything so we can make sure we're not causing unintentional harm. Big purchase power. We all love shopping. And if we can shop and make a positive impact, that's a certainly a double win in my book. And using our voice, people are people are excited about that. And, you know, even just posting on Facebook, like Katie mentioned, so other people become aware uh, because they may not have time to stop by the fridge, but they certainly want to help. Awesome. Thank, thanks for sharing. And now moving ahead, uh, what is the likelihood, slightly different question, that you are able to take some form of civic action in the next 30 days? And, uh, you know, I think I want to call out that if that's not realistic for you, that's okay. You know, we we really dove into the barriers for taking action. And while we can be very inspiring right now, we also have to be realistic about our time and resources. But I'm loving seeing that the majority of us think they definitely will take action in the next 30 days. I see that we have some folks that say not right now. And for those that may not feel like this is likely, I just wanna encourage you to remember that civic actions can be informal. So it's a conversation at the dinner table with your family about an issue impacting your community. It's as simple as cooking a meal for a neighbor experiencing a health issue. And it doesn't always have to look like one big grand gesture or commitment. I know sometimes that's overwhelming for me where I think if I commit to something, it needs to be the long term. But you can take small actions that truly make a big difference. So wherever you fall along the spectrum, our hope is that you leave this session inspired by civic engagement in some way. We'd love everyone to take a few minutes to draft an I will statement. I'll open up here. This statement should guide whatever commitment you want to make after you leave this session. Like I said, it can be big or small. What is your what's next? I think this is something I'm excited about because I often come away from webinars or learning sessions really inspired, but I think writing an I will statement really operationalizes what I'm feeling and makes the chance of success and the chance for action in the future much more likely. Talk with my friends about tough social issues, even when it's hard. That's really commendable. I think sometimes we, we prefer to keep it light and there's definitely space for that, but Amongst friends, that's when we can do the most learning and listening. Oh, I love this. Take one action of the civic circle in 30 days. That's very good. Dedicate time to learn more about a new cause. Share learnings more often with my friends and family. Yeah, it can be an ongoing conversation. It doesn't need to be a formal sit down at a dinner table. Just share when you learn and, and have that ongoing dialogue. Be smart about my next purchase. Very good support and lead civic engagement activities at my company. Awesome. These are great. I, I love seeing everyone's different approach to the I will statement. And as you read everyone's responses, take a moment to think about the collective impact of these individual actions. And so what I love is that a lot can be accomplished even within this group of people here today. I know, and I, I know Katie and I certainly covered a lot of material today in this quick hour. And so as you transition back into your work day, your regular life, your priorities, we want to leave you with five key takeaways for you to think about after this session. First, civic engagement is not about everyone doing the same thing or supporting something in the same ways. It's where your passions, interests, and skills connect with what your community or the issue you care about needs. Next, the civic circle, specifically that the combination of civic actions is critical to see change happen. No one civic action can solve a societal issue or problem. Third, privilege and access can impact how people support what they care about. Barriers to engagement 
exist for many people. And that's just the harsh truth. It's important to be mindful of power dynamics and how you can help eliminate them. Fourth, listening and learning is the foundation of all civic actions. To respond in the way our communities need, we must first understand the root causes and recommended solutions. And finally, most excitingly, change starts with you. Any time is a great time to get started. And with that, we wanna thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Katie and I enjoyed seeing all of the great ideas and insights you shared, and we extra appreciate the participation. I know sometimes there were uncomfortable questions, but I think that's what makes these sessions transformational and really meaningful. We hope you're inspired to continue on your own civic journey. So that's it. That is our civic circle learning session. And if this were an employee facing session, something that you offered to your colleagues, what we would typically do at this point is let folks know what the next steps look like. Typically that includes a follow-up email with a link to some video and digital magazine resources. It might include specific information for how your company supports civic engagement, an upcoming opportunity. And then we would typically also ask employee attendees to complete a survey and let us know what they learned about civic engagement and civic action and what they might be ready to do next. So we always like to make sure that there's a specific call to action for folks following one of our opportunities. I wanna encourage you in just the last minute that we have together to think about how this learning session might be leveraged within your company. So just a few ideas, things that you can be thinking about. Perhaps you are planning a day or a week of service and you have a group of employees that can't step away from their computer or they don't have enough time to be able to travel to a service site. The Civic Circle Learning Session can be a great way to engage them in a virtual offering. It can be a great tool for onboarding new hires or for your class of summer interns. Perhaps it can be a training for your employees that are stepping up to serve as volunteer leaders or champions or ambassadors. Maybe it's something that you could incorporate in an internal leadership development or talent development program. We really think the Civic Circle has broad application and we hope it's something that you'll be excited about sharing with your employees and bringing to your company. This content can be lightly customized to be relevant for your social issues and your philanthropic and social impact context. So if you're interested in talking more with us about that opportunity, feel free to screenshot what you see here to grab Shelby's email and send her a note. My team would be happy to talk with you. We will also be sending out the recording of today's session, as well as a survey. We love feedback for you to tell us about your experience today and to give us some feedback. So we hope you will take a minute to check that out. And my colleague Katie has also put in the slides, uh, pardon me, put in the chat, a link to some more resources about our civic circle and how you can bring that to life within your own company. So thank you everyone for joining us today. It was great to spend the hour with you. I feel inspired by all the civic actions you're gonna take and hopefully we can continue to inspire more folks around us, more folks within our companies to take civic action. That's how we're ultimately gonna create the change in communities that we want. So have a great day everyone and thanks again for joining us.